Okay, here we are once again, switching here sides this time. Now. Yep, right just trying to mic. keep it fresh. On my left now, we're, but we're correct now. We're fire and ice. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> oh we just got fire. And ice. <laughs> oh, the people yeah. are gonna. You'll see. That's gonna catch on. People are gonna start to know us that way. Like, oh, the fire and ice of anxiety. Yes. <laughs> I know them. I got fire and ice tickets for Friday night. At the <laughs> right. Anyway, I feel like um, with a name like that, we're going to disappoint people, but that's well, fine. We will disappoint everybody. Yeah. Yeah. There's no doubt about it. <laughs> <laughs> I think. Um, anyway, welcome back, guys, to my my left or whoever. It's Lauren Rosen uh, at the Obsessive Mind on Instagram, my friend and now frequent collaborator, which is freaking awesome. Which is so right? fun. I love it. Yes, actual and working therapist in uh, LA. La -la That's right. Yeah. Just yeah. south. And this to my right is Drew Lincelotta, the anxious truth, the dot anxious dot truth <laughs> on Instagram. Uh, and he's amazing. If, if you're coming from my page, go follow him. He's got a podcast. He's, you know, oh. writes books. He's very, very prolific in his was offerings. My first official day of grad school too. <gasps> it was the initial first day. Yes. How yeah. was it? I do not want to cite any more papers that talk about nature versus oh. nurture and anxiety and depression. I, I'm done. I'm done for today. That's it. Okay. For today. I was like, I've got bad news. Spoiler <laughs> <Yeah, I, laughs> yeah. alert. You're going to be doing this for the next two years. So, uh, yeah. There's a lot of citation in grad school. Yeah, it's yeah, true. Yeah. yeah. It's been a while. Anyway, today we're going to talk about health anxiety because people have asked us to talk about it. Here is what I, I'm going to throw this at you right away. We have not pre-discussed this. We have no idea what we're going to talk about. So I'm going to put Lauren on the spot immediately. Health anxiety no in the DSM is not OCD. Well, I know. Really, like, I don't like the DSM. Can I be honest? I just was. I'm okay. <laughs> you can say it with me. You just were. Exactly. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, it's not. It's not even an anxiety disorder in the DSM. In the DSM-5, it's. I think it's in with the somatoform disorders. I think that's the broader category. I, I'm mm -hmm. not positive on that yeah. because it's not typically something that I look into. I don't see a lot of other disorders in that realm, but of course I see a fair amount of health anxiety, but this is the problem with trying to categorize things is that we end up putting things into boxes that in many respects probably do make sense. And I'm sure that based on the research and you know, the people who create the DSM, it does make sense from a clinical vantage point. The idea that health anxiety and OCD are not part of the anxiety disorders is is beyond me. That makes no sense to me at all. Mm -mm. No. I mean, I you know, uh, I'm not one. You know, I, I don't claim qualifications yet in this, but it doesn't look much different to me. The person who has health anxiety seems to exhibit all of the same issues. There's a there's an obsession, and there is just a slew of compulsions that feed that obsession. Right. But I guess my question to you is, because I, I have some pretty strong feelings about this, but do you see a big difference between people with panic disorder and agoraphobia and OCD? Do you see a big difference with people with generalized anxiety disorder and OCD? No. I mean, I think in the end, it all is the themes are always the same. There's tension yeah. and release, tension and release, tension and release. That, that's really in the end. But I mean, we could probably argue that all of life is that. But yeah, I think no, I don't see a lot of difference. The specific fixations and the specific fears. That's, that's the difference. Totally. Yeah. It's like they're all particular phobias, basically. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I would agree with that. I would agree with that. And I guess maybe health anxiety would be a little more specific than, you know, panic disorder, agoraphobia, like non-specific phobia. But nonetheless, this is just splitting hairs. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And and maybe health anxiety is a little less specific than something like arachnophobia, right? Which is very narrowly focused, or you know, any of the like a metaphobia, which is very all about fear of of throwing up, right? Like that's that's super narrow. And then to your point, like we we get broader with things like panic disorder and agoraphobia and OCD. It's just you know it. Again, it's often very specific things. Um, yeah. So generalized anxiety, it'll pick on, but it's the same cycle. And I think maybe talking about that would be helpful for people who are listening to better appreciate like what how how this relates to OCD, because of course there are so many videos about OCD out there, probably a lot more than health anxiety. So. And seeing the 
the relationship between all of these things helps you to listen and pick out things that resonate for you. Yeah, that's a great conversation. Uh, the thing that I get all the time, since I'm, I'm generally the panic disorder and agoraphobia has been my wheelhouse and the, the health anxiety folks and the OCD folks and the GAD folks will say, yeah, but what's my recovery plan? What's my plan for health anxiety? I don't, I don't have to worry about driving around the block. I can do that. So right. they miss the principle that says, yeah, but your discomfort comes from not doing things as opposed to doing things. So you have to start not doing things. So if I walk in the door and present with health anxiety for you, what is my plan? Let's answer that question because people ask me all the time. They're probably tired of hearing me answer it. <laughs> well, that no, I love that. That's such a great question. So somebody comes to in and they have, let's say, anxiety about whether or not they might have cancer. Mm -hmm. And they've been to any number of doctors who have all said definitively, no, you don't currently have cancer. And yet there is this huge fear that keeps coming up for the person. The way that I'm going to conceptualize that with them, and I'm uh, essentially in the, in the first session, I'm going to lay this all out for them because I think it's important that they understand this, mm -hmm. is that the whole process starts with a trigger. So, and that can be an internal trigger or an external trigger. You're walking along, minding your business when all of a sudden an image pops into your head of you laying in a hospital bed. And then all of a sudden you think, oh my gosh, but I forgot. What if I have cancer? You might also have a physical sensation, which is where this starts to appear a lot like uh, panic disorder, agoraphobia. Um, you might feel... I don't know, like a pinching in the area of your lungs and think, oh my gosh, what if that's lung cancer? And, or you might be walking along and see a sign for, for cancer treatment. And all of a sudden, again, that thought pops in, oh my gosh, what if I have cancer and I don't know it. Mm -hmm. And this of course elicits a great deal of anxiety for somebody uh, with this particular condition, uh, the uncertainty and the doubt that are generated by this unknown make people feel very uncomfortable. And so they do compulsions and compulsions are also known as safety behaviors. And those things from, in my estimation are almost identical. The idea is that, okay, if I think about this, if I ruminate about this, if I try to like feel and check my physical feelings and make sure that they're normal, if I call the doctor or if I avoid the doctor, or if I call a friend or a family member who was with me at the last doctor's appointment who can reassure me, uh, if I, um, let's see, I'm trying to think of anything else. If I take this, this supplement or this pill, this will prevent me from having, you know, having cancer develop or whatnot, which it gets messy because of course people do take supplements and, and do things yeah. to right. prevent, but it's when it well, becomes excessive. And there's the pervasive, if I Google this and I research enough about it, I can, I can be sure that I don't have it. Yes. Yep. That's a good one. Dr. Google <laughs> to Dr. the, Google not rescue actually no. as the case and may be I rescue yeah yeah so uh so yeah so there are all of these things these behaviors that people do this is by no means exhaustive and and people get very creative and this all results sometimes in temporary relief which means that the next time that you're walking and you see a sign for cancer and you have that thought you know exactly what to do with that anxiety you know that you're going to do this behavior. And over time, the behaviors start to impede upon your ability to live, mm -hmm. impairing your life. And so to round this out, though, and because I feel like I've been talking, I want to hear from you. No, this is really good stuff. <laughs> well, thanks. Um, but I think if we're looking at this process of trigger leads to thought, leads to feeling, leads to behavior, that's the same across the board. And that negative reinforcement, that temporary relief that you, that again, you don't always get it, but you get it enough that it reinforces that whole cycle that happens in panic disorder. It happens in agoraphobia. It happens in health anxiety. It happens in OCD. It happens in phobias. It happens in generalized anxiety disorder. It happens yeah. across the board. And so people learn that these behaviors are the answer and they are until they become the problem. 
Yeah, or they, they become part of the problem. They make things worse. So the plan, you know, how can I have a plan for my health anxiety? Well, identifying what those compulsions, those safety behaviors, those rituals are, and then phasing them out. You're mm -hmm. going to have to work on not doing those. So mm -hmm. when you are convinced that you must call the doctor again for the fourth time in three weeks, you have to not. And it might be, I always try and tell people like, okay, look, it's not like you can never call the doctor ever again for the rest of your life instantly like cold turkey, but don't call for two hours. You're going to have to surf through two hours of discomfort. And then if you think you got to make that call, go ahead. But the next time it better be three hours and the next time it's going to be four hours. So yeah. that yeah. seems to be, uh, that seems to work for people in a lot of instances. Yeah. Delaying yeah. the the behavior I think is huge and it helps people to understand that they have the capacity to tolerate that discomfort. Yeah. For sure. Yeah. A little space between the thought and the action so that, you know, okay, I can think about this a little more. Yeah. One thing that I find particularly insidious and health things are too, too hard to me, the two hardest groups of people to deal with are the people with health anxiety and the emetophobes because mm -hmm. both will tell you that they, no, 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 it's entirely justified. Yeah entirely justified. So I like to look at health anxiety sometimes as uh, like an, an uncertainty intolerance disorder, really. Because in the end, unless you can get anything less than 100% certainty or 0% chance of cancer is unacceptable. If right, which is totally if unreasonable. Right, if it isn't zero, it's not acceptable because I'm going to say, well, the doctor could have, the 10th doctor could have missed it. That's true. But the odds yeah. are so against that, but it doesn't matter. The odds are not zero. So I must act to get them to zero. And yeah. it will, you can't, you can never get to zero ever with anything ever in life. So no. And that's actually, I think of OCD as an intolerance. Same uh, thing. Yeah. yeah of, of uncertainty. uncertainty intolerance disorder. Totally. They almost all are. Almost. They all are. Yeah. yeah. Like I could have a panic attack when I leave the house. So I'm not going to leave the house. It's like, well, sure. yeah, you could have a panic attack. <laughs> like, that's a possibility. Um, and so learning how to make space for the fact, and the, I, I think with health anxiety, because we are, we're all going to die if, you know, I mean, just so you no. know, good for you. That's great. <laughs> Maybe we could do an episode on that. I'm I mean, interested. Next, next month. Yeah, next year. <laughs> <laughs> you and my frozen head, like Walt Disney. It's going to be great. good for you. Um, so yeah, I, I think that because of that and recognizing that we have to make space for the fact that we we are going to have illnesses, that that has to be an acceptable element of our lives or it's going to take over our lives. It's, it's either or. It's not like you either allow for uncertainty or you are consumed with trying to defeat uncertainty, which spoiler alert is not an actual, you can't do it. It's not, not possible. possible. Right. It's not possible. I always find uh, one of the things that's fascinating too. And again, it's health anxiety, but yes, it spills over into all of these things. We swim in uncertainty every day, all day long. Like life arose on the planet 3.5 billion years ago, and it's been uncertain every day since. Yep. So you're uncertain when you get in your car, you're uncertain when you eat an apple, I could choke on that apple. It's certainly possible. There's uncertainty yep. everywhere, but for some reason, when it comes to this, my health, oh, I can't tolerate, but not that uncertainty. Everything else I can tolerate, not that. Right. Because and that health, specific. You know, important. Yeah, I can't take a chance. Right. But what's interesting is that in the same breath, you just said, I, if you get in your car, you're accepting uncertainty, right? That you might get into a car accident. Yeah. That's, that's your health. I know, but it, it's so interesting how that connection is often not made. Well, and I think part of it is the, the perceived control and the responsibility that we take, right? Mm -hmm. That there's, and some people are afraid of driving and afraid of getting into car accidents and that for them, that's the one that they're not willing to accept. But I think whenever somebody zeroes in on where they have the ability to prevent something catastrophic from happening. That's where it's like, well, but I could do this. I could do this thing to prevent this. And, you know, and that's where, again, of course we, pre we do things to prevent bad things from happening. Sure. I, you know, I, I take supplements, right? Like, because they're supposed to be, some of them are supposed to be good for my health, right? Like, like, okay. Sure. Um, and that's not a problem. It doesn't deter from my life. It's not like I'm, you know, constantly looking up new supplements and I'm making sure that I'm on the right ones or something to that effect. Um, right. The, the action is not life impacting. It doesn't. Right. 
yeah. because it's, yeah, well, this is, this is where I like to go into the realm of economics. I bet you didn't expect to Whoa. hear that today, but <laughs> my bearings. All right, let's, let's do it. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think it's all down to opportunity cost and the law of diminishing returns. Oh boy. Yeah. I, I use the term life math. i like to think I invented that. Life math. <laughs> life math. We all, we, all day long, we all do life math. There's risk reward and everything. We're calculating all day long in our heads. The variables that get plugged into life math for health anxiety are completely twisted. Mm. So we, you put in variables and where I think that variable is worth 0.6, you think that variable is worth 6 million. And yeah. so it completely changes the outcome of the equation. So I like the opportunity cost though. It's similar, very similar. I love the life math. That's life excellent. Math. Yeah. Oh, TM. TM. Maybe I got to trade. I like that a lot. Yeah. No. And I think, yes, the opportunity cost piece, it's you're looking at, okay, at a certain point. Well, and I think more, what's more relevant here is the element of, of uh, the law of diminishing returns, because at a certain point you're investing uh, resources into something, but you're getting increasingly less on your return over time. So for anyone who's listening, I like I'm a geek and I love ec economics, but I, the idea, and I'm somewhat limited is that at first there's a direct correlation. This is a graph, by the way, it's a line on a graph, just so you know. Of course it is. <laughs> so, um, there's a direct correlation, right. Between input and output. So if I invest, let's look at like money. If I invest, um, I don't know, a hundred dollars into my home to get something fixed, that that's going to have a, a direct result in how much I could, I don't know, rent my home for, for okay. example. Yeah. So at first it's a direct, they, you input and then you get a nice output, right? And the same thing goes for health anxiety. If I input, um, you know, 30 minutes a day to go for a jog or a walk, like that's going to positively impact my, my health. Mm -hmm. Um, if I am so consumed with trying to make sure that I don't get cancer, that I'm incapable of spending time, like meaningful time with my friends and family without asking for constant reassurance or spending all of my time in my head trying to figure it out or on my phone with Google. Mm -hmm. We've gotten to a point where the return on investment is start, starting to level off and eventually go down. It's, it ultimately becomes negative. I would That's think. That's right. That's right. Yeah. There's, like, it's the law like of the, the, the point of diminishing returns. And then there's the point, oh, I can't remember what it is, but there is a second point where you, you go below start to zero, lose. I would think. Yeah. You start to, lose. I would imagine. Yeah. It's certainly less than it, like it's you, you start, it starts to be a, an added cost. So I would think the person who is crippled by that and is, is just continually involved in those compulsions and safety behaviors would probably describe a, a negative net effect. Yes. I, I, I have no life anymore because I'm just yes. consumed all the time. And I hear that heartbreakingly every day. Totally. Me, me too. Yeah. And so if, you know, if you're watching, I would encourage you to go look at a graph because that's going to give you a better sense than my little hand puppet show over here. But like, yeah. Um, um, and out the car window. <laughs> Do, do, do. <laughs> but I, I think recognizing we're okay, we're trying to land right around the point of diminishing returns, which means sometimes you're going to go a little bit further than what is going to best serve you. And sometimes you're going to go a little less far than what's going to serve you. And that's the point that people with health anxiety are afraid of. I'm going to miss something. I'm not going to, I'm going to go a little under too far or a little under far enough rather. And then I'm going to miss the thing. I'm going to miss the disease. Yeah. But I think that's the part that makes health anxiety into so one day we'll do an emetophobia episode because that's another yeah. other topic. But I think that's the part where health anxiety becomes almost unique in the, in the resistance that it presents, at least in my community, somebody mm -hmm. with panic disorder or agoraphobia understands these are irrational fears. I don't want to be like this anymore. There's no good reason for me to run back home every time I think I'm going to have a heart attack. They recognize that. And they yeah. recognize the negative impact. The person with health anxiety knows there's a negative impact, but will still assert, but it, but it's rational. There's a reason for it though. 
Yeah. That I, if I, I might miss something if I don't do this. Whereas the person with panic disorder agoraphobia never says, but I might miss something. It's very rare. Instance by instance, maybe. But what if this time it's really a heart attack? But I feel like the person with health anxiety and job, what I hear, one of the things I hear all the time is I have a family. I can't take that kind of chance. I have kids. I can't take that kind of chance. Right. But the, the disorder will rationalize why it has to continue to exist. And at some point it becomes, I can't argue. I can't try to reason with your health anxiety. I can only show you what it is. Yeah. After that, you're going to have to accept or not accept that. Right. Yes, yeah. absolutely. And, and you're right. People with OCD do, do this all the time too. I can't take the risk that I might murder my family. What are you talking about? Sure. You know, uh, and, and the reality is that if we want to live our lives at a certain point, you, that's, that's the choice to be made. And then I would suggest that the best choice is to accept that possibility so that you can move on with your life and live yeah. what life you have. It's ultimately it's rearranging deck chairs on the Titanic. That's what, what that is, right? Is I'm going to make sure that I don't have cancer right now, but the reality is it's coming. Like <laughs> you, you can right. check all the time and trying to make sure that, that your, your time on the Titanic, like everything looks just so, but the same, the ship is sinking. It doesn't matter in the end. No. So do you want to like spend the last two hours of your life w doing purposeful, meaningful things? And I'm not saying like in the metaphor, two no, hours I, of your life. Yeah. Um, or do you want to rearrange the deck chairs, which seems to me to be a huge waste of your I, energy and your time. I would agree. Uh, one of the things I also find interesting where I think it helps health anxiety starts to look a lot like OCD is I, don't, I guess you wouldn't officially call it a backdoor spike because it's officially not OCD, but the person who does start to get over those compulsions, who suddenly discovers I'm freaking out because I'm not scanning for cancer or right. I'm, not, I'm not, I haven't checked my blood pressure in three weeks. And that's, what if that means I want to have a heart attack or what if, so. Or what if it means that I missed the thing? I missed it, right? I missed it. I'm, I'm anxious because I'm not vigilant anymore. So, yes. oh, it's, uh, it's again, it's tough. I'm not, oh, uh, like I'm angry at the people. It's heartbreaking to see that because they yeah. break it. And then it wants to drag them back in by telling them, no, it's it's wrong to not do that. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Difficult. One, one of the things that I will say, though, for like a, a, the plus column of having a disorder that that you can make a reasonable argument for spending time churning or doing whatever behaviors is that in recovery, it generalizes to a much broader spectrum of things in life, which accepting uncertainty across the board is probably the best thing that I've learned how to do as a human, right? Like it's, it's oh, yeah. served me so well. And I think when you recognize, oh, it's with everything. It's with, oh, it's everything's that's... uncertain that whereas if you're saying, oh, well, but this thing doesn't matter. So of course I can accept uncertainty here. When you learn to accept uncertainty about the things that matter, that's where real freedom is, right? Yeah. It's a big deal. I, I for me, I always say one of the lessons I learned, that's true. And people will say to me now, I've always, I've always been kind of a cooler cucumber, but now, especially and they're like, the building is on fire and you're just like, I'm like, I got in my car every freaking morning resigned to die on the Long Island Expressway with a horrible heart attack where I would take out 16 families with me. Yeah. This is nothing. The fact yeah. that I'm not so sure about what my tax bill is going to be is literally nothing now. Yeah. So it, it yeah. does. It does generalize. It puts life into perspective and it makes you so much more psychologically resilient and flexible, I think. Totally. Anyway. Yeah. No, that's absolutely. Yes. Because once you, you face the big thing, yeah. Yes, if you get through this, your threat, I call it threat threat assessment. Like mm -hmm. what most people see as a threat these days, I there are no threats. I see almost no threats in the world anymore. There yeah. are, don't get me wrong, there are, but they are very small list now. Because well, And when they come up, I don't know, because I certainly have, there are threats. or There, there are threats that, in the world. I'm not trying to dismiss the world, there are. Totally, and even things that make me anxious, right? But But when they come up, it's sort of like, Okay. All right. Well, here it is. Like, I'm not gonna. I don't have any control over it, so I guess we'll see. You know that I there's either do something about this, and if I can't, oh well. I guess yes. I'll have to wait to see tomorrow and see what happens. Yeah. So, yeah. So if you can get past the health anxiety thing, as difficult as we both know that that is, yeah, the rewards are really something. Yeah.
Yeah. Yeah, for sure. So I think it's all down to limiting behavior to what's reasonable in terms of practical application of this is yeah. saying, okay, well, it's reasonable to get a second opinion on something. Probably not to get a 15th, you know? Right. Uh, yeah, that's true. And I think in the end it becomes, uh, and it's hard to find that, that point. I always try and say, look, if you feel like the thing that you're going to do, or you feel compelled to do to stay safe is a thing you would have to explain to me why you have to do that. You probably don't have to do that. That's such a good, yeah. yeah. Well, like whether that. it's to me, Lauren, a friend, your mother, yeah. who it doesn't matter, the guy at the grocery store, if somebody would look at you sideways and say, why are you doing that? There's a really good chance that you probably don't have to do that. Yep. And ultimately you have to accept uncertainty Yeah, and in order to move on, you have to accept that like, maybe that is the right choice because that's where people, people want to find that point. It's the same thing with the law of diminishing returns. They want to find the exact point when mm -hmm. they're, they're maximizing the results of what, what they're putting in and they're not willing to go below that. And the reality, like you have to be willing to not to not get there, to not get to that exact point. You might, you might fall shy of it a couple of points. And that's, yeah. that's what, that's the price of freedom. Yeah. So sometimes you'll miss the mark, but I think sometimes you, if the mark is here, sometimes, like you said, you're above it, you're below it. You're, it there's no totally. way you, you can't lock it in. It's not a groove. It's a target and it floats. And sometimes you miss it and sometimes you get it. And right. that's, that's, and that's everything. where, and that's where you have to be willing to sometimes make the mistake of doing compulsions or safety behaviors too. And it's like, it's not, the aim isn't to be absolutely free, right. Of doing right. all behaviors, but you know, maybe sometimes you make the extra call to your doctor and in retrospect, you go, Oh, I, I didn't, I didn't that have was, to do that. Yeah. But you don't need to now beat yourself up or over it or try to get recovery so perfect and not make, like, make sure that you only make the right amount of calls because then you've turned recovery into just another way to do it right and to yeah. fix it. And it's compulsive. That, that was worth the price of admission right there, folks. Those oh. last two minutes. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you too. You know, yeah. Sometimes you get it wrong and it doesn't mean you failed and you're crashing and burning. It just means, well, what can I learn from that? And exactly. Yeah, exactly. So good. I love our conversations. Oh, I know. It's so fun. Like we could do these every day. Me so too. we'll do it again next week for sure. Anyway, we'll wrap it up. That's health anxiety. We could talk about this. People with health anxiety would listen to us talk about this for a day, like a marathon. Totally. You know? Oh my gosh. <laughs> you would hate us after. <laughs> yeah. You know, to be like, okay, I'm out. Can out. Yeah. Really? Um, Is this still happening? <laughs> well, I'm sure if you guys have questions or comments, by all means, throw them in the comment section, wherever you happen to be watching this, which really is either my YouTube or maybe, I don't know if you post these on Instagram. I, I don't post them on I, Instagram. I haven't posted them on Instagram. They're just on your YouTube, I think, but Whatever. Although I can, because they're great. So, like, you know, I think. Yeah, by all means, I've had it. But anyway, if you want to ask questions, ask them in the comment section. I'd be happy to answer them, of all, of course. And I'll put it up on the screen. If you're coming from my side of the fence and you do not follow Lauren, here she is at the Obsessive Line on Instagram. So go get that, because it's all good stuff. And this is Drew. Don't forget, yeah. the.anxious.truth. <laughs> go follow that guy. He's awesome. He's got lots of good stuff to say. Oh, thank you very much. Mm -hmm. All right, guys. I guess we do this every month. I don't know what we're going to talk about next month, but we'll do it again. So it's a surprise. If you, have, if you have a topic that you want to suggest, throw that in the comments also, and we'll throw it in the hopper. All right. Sounds good. See you next time. Bye. Awkward and the recording.